I'd like to now introduce today's speaker, William Sharp. Mr. Sharp has been in the tax business since he was eight years old when he started in the mailroom of the family enterprise. In 2005, he teamed with Bill and Deborah Sharp to open Total Income Tax LLC. William is an enrolled agent and a certified tax resolution specialist and is a member of four national professional associations. William lives with his family just four minutes from his Peoria office. Okay, William, welcome. And I'll ask you to go ahead and start your video. Okay, awesome. There we go. You see me? All right. Hey, everybody. My name is William Sharp. I have an office on uh, Forest Hill Avenue, um, which is right next door to Nina Hardware. We're just about a block off of University in the center of Peoria. So not in chill coffee, but close. And uh, thanks for having me. Um, <clears throat> Like Catherine has mentioned, we're going to have some time for a Q&A at the end. And if you have a, a question, uh, depending on the amount of people, I was going to make it possibly a little informal where you didn't have to wait till the end if you had a, a busy afternoon and couldn't sit through the whole presentation or what have you. Um, but one of the challenges with um, these types of presentations in the tax world is to keep people awake. Um, so that's one of the the challenges that I think I'm up to uh, is to kind of make it fun, if, as fun as we can with taxes, but also um, to try to not have a topic where um, it's it's too finite or it's, it, it, I want to make this all as all encompassing as we can because we're having people with a lot of different types of businesses, a lot of different industries. So if there's a point when um, you feel it's a little too generic, I apologize, but that was my intent is just to to not alienate some people by saying, oh, wow, I don't, I don't deal with that at all. So just as a preface. So once again, thanks for having me. Um, the topic I, I decided to uh, kind of title this presentation is analyzing uh, accounting and tax misconceptions. Because uh, one thing that I do as a tax preparer and accountant is I uh, meet uh, prospects and, account and clients that get their tax advice, not necessarily from another accountant, down the road or in a different town, they get tax and accounting advice from their barber mechanic, uh, the person at the barber shop, you know, the person sitting next to them at the bar, things like that. So um, it's not unique to just to this industry, but one thing I wanted to do is I hear a lot of, of um, kind of misconceptions that I have to clarify with clients and that's my job. So that's what I did is I, I basically formed a list of things that I hear a lot. And then I wanted to go through and kind of give you my perspective on um, how they're actually treated in the real world. Um, so the first thing is um, with, with tax and accounting misconceptions is um, I wanted to talk about something that I think a lot of you guys would have is, and that is um, your automobile expenses. Now, uh, for many of us, our auto expenses are the, the biggest expense um, that we have on our tax return. Um, and then a lot of what I'm gonna to say today too is um, geared for what the IRS looks for and how they react to things. So we can, one of our goals is for our clients to be sort of what we kind of call it audit proof with their tax return as far as their documentation and things. So when I mention IRS, IRS, audit, audit all the time, I don't mean to be a fear monger, but that's just sort of how we position it to, you know, eventually, if you're self-employed for 20 or 30 years, you're eventually gonna have a conversation with the IRS. They're gonna pull your number effectively and kind of check things out. So we just try to be realistic and make sure people are prepared for that, what we feel is an eventual conversation with the IRS. So now with automobile expenses, the reason I started off with this is for one, um, it's, it's the, probably the most common amongst everybody. Um, secondly, I think the reason is um, that I wanted to start with this is this is a deduction that is the first thing that an IRS auditor would look at if they were to look at your tax return. And it's also commonly um, taken away from you in an audit. And the reason why is people don't have a tremendous amount of, of backup. Um, of course, with the IRS, you are sort of guilty until proven innocent, which is the reverse. So what I mean by that is um, a lot of times if you have $20,000 for automobile expenses and you can't prove it, there's a lot of auto auditors that would 
um, just change that $20,000 to zero because if you don't have any substantiation, you don't get the expense oftentimes. So a couple of easy ways, especially, um, it's a lot easier now than it was 10 or 20 years ago because um, most of us have our phone clutched very close to us at all times. So what I would recommend with auto expenses is to get Mile IQ. It's probably the most common, um, easily used free app that's out there and track your mileage. And because one thing that I always kind of instruct and suggest and counsel people on with, with automobile expenses, and the, one of the reasons that they shouldn't really guesstimate is I think a lot of people tend to estimate low. So that's one reason you don't want to estimate. You don't realize how much you drive and how quickly it accumulates. So if anything, that's one benefit to use something like Mile IQ. Um, and with Mile IQ, you, you know, using that term audit proof, it really does um, make it to where when you, the IRS would kind of check in with you, it would be a very short conversation in terms of automobile expenses because um, basically they would, the Mile IQ, using them as an example for that app, um, they, you can print out a report that, that is very good that substantiates everything. Now, over and above Mile IQ, there's only one other thing you have to do, and that is to have a, an objective third-party receipt um, is the easiest way to do it to, to, to verify your mileage. So um, a lot of people are handy and change their own oil, you know, and do their own auto repairs if their mufflers uh, you know, need a repair and things like that. We suggest that um, to go to your local uh, Quickie Lube place and get an oil change. And the reason why, not every time, but maybe once or twice a year, the reason we encourage that is because they stamp your odometer reading on the receipt. So, you know, that combined with Mile IQ, the, if you have a couple of receipts in a row, you can kind of tell what clip you're driving, what pace, and just sort of verify that. So that's one thing that I wanted to start off with and about, um, you know, the misconceptions that may be out there about mileage. Um, and it's, it's a real thing that when, when they show up, that's 99% of the time, that's the first thing the auditor uh, talks about because it's in their eyes, it's the easiest thing to, to take away from the taxpayer because the taxpayer isn't, has a substantiated deduction. So moving on, um, another misconception I thought I would want to bring up is, you know, the, the current truth about IRS audits. Um, and then there's, there's sort of an old way of doing audits and a new way. Um, currently, most of the audits that I see in, in our office, they're called mail audits. And it's a new way of doing things. Um, quickly, the old way of doing things would be you'd get a letter, an auditor would get your file, and um, they would go through everything, A to Z. You know, if you're self-employed, all of the advertising, utilities, supplies, all your cost of goods sold, and they'd verify everything. Well, that's a, a long process. It's very laborious for the auditor, um, especially if, uh, if, if somebody is disorganized. And these audits can take a very long period of time. So that's the old way. They go through everything A to Z. And usually you're sitting across the desk from somebody, and it's the IRS auditor from your town or the neighboring town. The new way of doing it is the IRS sends you a letter, and they pinpoint, rather than, they don't want to see all of your expenses anymore. They, they're there for specific reasons. And, um, you know, they have indicated through, you know, their data of, of what a self-employed uh, barber should have for expenses in the Midwest. And so they have all that data. And when your expenses kind of are off one, one way or the other, it, it sort of makes a red light go off and then they will investigate further. So point being, Rather than them wanting to see all your expenses, they're just looking for a couple of items. The downside is these letters are coming from Austin, Texas, or somewhere from New York. So, um, so it's, it's a little more difficult to communicate with the auditor because they're not sitting across um, the table from you. you know, of course, a lot of times we've had um, situations where the business is unique. And the first thing we have to do is kind of educate the auditor on you know, what makes this business unique and some, maybe there isn't a little bit of, of a regular expense. It's maybe abnormally high, but we try to do that. That's a little bit tougher through writing and through uh, not being able to be face to face with them. So um, the old way and the new way, 
which is better. I don't think it's like, it's, uh, there is no, it's, it's, it's tough. There, there is no better way, but the, the, just be pre more of be prepared for it as far as how they're doing business these days. They're, they're able to get process more people and kind of get more money on their, from their perspective, because they're going to stick with it um, for this way. Um, you know, the one thing that um, I'm just checking things off the list. One other misconception that I see a lot is people that um, it, it comes time to file their tax return. And this is something I've, I, I talk about a lot because it's something that I still see it happen a lot is it's April 15th or this year we're coming up on October 15th and I don't have the money to pay. I prepare the taxes. I have a balance due and I don't have the money. It, intuitively, the, the one thing that a lot of people do and I don't blame them is they don't file the tax return. You know, why would I file it if I don't have the money? And they, it's, it's kind of like there it's, you know, they, they only want to do it if they can complete the process. So I understand that. Um, the reality is it's, that's probably the worst thing that we can do as taxpayers, if we owe to not file the tax return. And the reason why in, in a nutshell is there's a myriad of penalties and interests that the IRS assesses to you. And in a nutshell, the, the penalty for not paying is about is a fraction of the, of the penalty that they assess for not filing. So another way of saying that is if you file the return and not pay it, you'll pay a lot less money in the long run than waiting six months to file it and then pay it. You know, that will cost you a lot more money versus the other alternative, which is maybe I'm short on money now, let's file it now and then pay in six months. Between those different examples, um, it'd be much better just to file it and then you, you would pay less in penalty and interest at the end, especially the penalties. So that's one thing I, I wanna make sure everyone knows about if that ever comes up. Um, now, a, a couple other misconceptions or, or things that maybe people might not know about. Um, with self-employed folks, it's tough because if you know, I'm down the road from a PNC bank and a AutoZone and a Nina Ace Hardware, if you work at those places, you receive a W-2, of course, and your taxes are just, it's, they're magically withheld every pay period. The downside of self-employment is we have to withhold those and pay them as we go. So the tough part is um, that you're expected to do that quarterly. And with the IRS, um, they're of course always keeping you on your toes. Quarterly, you would think it's every three months. It's, it's not with the IRS, it's April, June, September and January is when those payments are due. Now the problem lies in the fact that when oftentimes um, for depending on your industry, some of those months may be horrible, especially with the seasonal business, you know, with, with, you know, the short of it is with a lot of businesses, the cash flow doesn't permit you to make uh, payments. You're not in a vacuum. It's not a perfect situation like that where you have um, ups and downs with your cash flow. So maybe you can make the April and June payments, but September is, is it's not going to work. So what we recommend a lot, one of our, I, I, I would consider it a secret. You know, one of the things that we've kind of carved out over the years that, that has worked with people that you have challenges with paying quarterly payments every, every quarter is breaking it down to be, to pay it more frequently. Now this is something you won't really see with the IRS in their publications or anything like that, but they will allow you to um, pay more frequently. So you can pay monthly, you can pay weekly. Um, I had a client one time that had some IRS issues and they would pay daily. Now, um, one example I always use with self-employed people is that, is that it's easier to pay the IRS uh, $100 a week than it is to write them a check for 5,200 bucks once, uh, once a year. Um, so, um, for a lot of businesses, you know, cash flow is king. So that's just one recommendation that I've had a lot of success with, with, with clients. And that is to kind of space it out where if quarterly doesn't work for you, there's other options. Um, and, and most of the time when I talk to people about that, they, you know, they're surprised that it's even an option because it, it seems like with their ass, there's only one way to do it. It's every quarter. And if you can't do that, you know, there, there are no other resources or suggestions. So 
Um, I would, the downside of course is, is that it is more tedious. You have to write that check or initiate that payment weekly and it's more annoying, but the thought is um, it's, I've seen the effects of it with a lot of people that when they go to file for that first time that they've kind of instituted this plan, there's something to be said for filing a tax return uh, and not having a balance due. It's already been paid for throughout the year. So I find that um, to be helpful and it, and, it, and it works for a lot of people that have had long struggles with income taxes and, and paying them as they go. Um, I, the next thing I, I jumbled a couple um, points together here and this, these are uh, quotes that I hear often in the, uh, in the, uh, in the office during, in, during tax season from clients. And um, it's things that I have to, you know, these are the most common kind of uh, pieces of guidance that I have to give that before in the presentation where people may be getting some not so good advice from the barbershop or their, where they congregate with their friends and family. Um, so I have to kind of dispel these things a lot. Um, I hear a lot from business owners that they don't want to show a profit and they're adamantly opposed to, to showing a profit. Um, and I get that because profit equals, you know, the course everyone knows the higher your profit, the higher your tax bill. Um, I have experienced that and, and, I, and I understand it, but I have also experienced a lot of businesses that, um, you know, oftentimes will help a, a business obtain financing for a project. And it's tough uh, from a bank, of course, and, and receive financing. So it's very tough to not have a profit and to be bankable, as, as we call it, to, to become bankable and to, to receive a loan. So I, um, you know, what I often see is sometimes folks that are adamantly opposed to a profit, they will maybe spend things in the, for, you know, spend money in the fourth quarter that's inappropriate. Um, and, and, and I am, don't get me wrong, I am, I don't want all of my clients to get huge tax bills, but when it comes time to the end of the year where you can forecast the end of the year and you're going to have a profit and a bigger one than last year, I just want the, the purchases to, for my clients to, to make sense that they need this item or it will make them more efficient, um, you know, make, generate more revenue or save time in, in their process. So, um. But, but just there's a probably a half a dozen different reasons why, you know, uh, profit, that uh, method of, or that level of thinking of being just allergic to a profit, I can't have that. I've seen a lot of things where you're, sport, you're kind of bending over dollars to pick up dimes. That, you know, that's the same school of thought in my, in my eyes. So um, just be leery of that. Once again, I'm not pro-profit. I don't like what my tax... Uh, clients to have a ton of profit, but I don't want to, conversely, I don't want people to foolishly spend a bunch of money uh, and drain the reserves in the fourth quarter or the end of their year when they may need it. Um, another thing that I hear is, um, um, you know, one of the quotes I hear is um, about skimming, okay? And skimming is, uh, is you know, shorthand or uh, jargon for people that you know, a customer pays you and it doesn't make it to the bank and it doesn't make it on the tax return. Um, that is a, once again, I've been in uh, instances before where it, I try to take a, 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 someone that I have to, to receive financing. And if, if you skim, it, it's just not worth it, it, it at the end of the, at the end of the day, I receive a lot. Uh, a feedback where people, everybody in my industry skims. I have to, you know, this is just the norm. They try to rationalize it in certain ways. Um, there's a lot of different reasons. I, I try to, um, to to strongly discourage that and implement things like um, tax planning, things that can maybe have the same net effect, but to, to be on the up and up. It's the short of it. It's just, it's just not worth it at the end of the day. And I don't, uh, and that's just something, a common thing that I hear a lot uh, at times, just asking questions on how cash transactions should be handled. Um, once again, it's, it's, you know, one thing I describe to people, it's not, um, 
it's not illegal to take the cash and not put it in the bank. It's illegal to not to take the cash, not put it in the bank and not put it on your tax return. So, um, of course, most of us know that. Um, you know, the, the last little quotable that I have here is that people want to know about red flags and uh, with pertaining to the tax return. You know, maybe I'll introduce a deduction to them and then they, a lot of folks would rightfully ask, hey, is this a red flag? How's my, because, um, you know, my, you know, I don't think I'm an exception to that personally either, which is you want to have, uh, take it up, take as many advantages and deductions and uh, leave, leave no stone unturned kind of thing for your tax return. But also, you don't want to mess with the IRS. You don't want to deal with them. You don't want to talk to them. You don't want them uh, messing with you. And I understand trying to walk the line there. So as far as a red flag, um, how we kind of define a red flag in our office is um, it increases your likelihood of getting audited, basically, is what a red flag is. Um, I'm sure maybe a lot of you feel the same way of what your definition is for it. So how we look at deductions um, is if people should take one example, I'll use a real life example, is an office in the home deduction. That is a red flag, no doubt about it. That, and another saying, of course, another way of saying red flag is that increases your chance of getting audited, okay? Um, what I do when I introduce those kind of deductions or when, when asked, I will look at, frankly, how organized the taxpayer is. If the taxpayer is very organized, um, I, you know, red flags aren't something that should be, you shouldn't be scared of. It should, it just increases your chance, you know, your chances of getting audited. They may inquire about a certain list of deductions, but if you're organized, there should be no reason why you wouldn't want to take an office in the home deduction. Um, so that's just one thing, you know, we, we kind of look at, are they organized? Once again, um, uh, one thing the IRS preys on is people that are, are disorganized and it's like that really nice guy from high school that can't quite seem to make it the first hour on time uh, but he's really nice and he's you know honest but he's comes in and his books are flying that's who the as an adult that's who the IRS is is preying on here um, somebody that's you know they kind of know and it sets the tone for any audits that you may encounter if you're if for or, if you're organized the the time is is a fraction and I think the, the auditors can frankly kind of smell that and sense that on their, uh, on their first meeting. Um, a couple of things too uh, with self-employment, I wanted to kind of pepper other things that I think would be helpful um, is one downside, just to shift gears, no more quotes um, for now, but um, one thing is as a self-employed person, one of the downsides of self-employment is once again, if you're working at, at PNC Bank down the road from me, uh, one of the things after, you, after you've been there a period of time is they're going to set you up with a retirement plan probably. Uh, self-employed people, we don't have that luxury of nobody stops in and says, hey, self-employed guy, you're going to start saving now. We have to initiate that ourselves. So that's one thing where, once again, we have hundreds and hundreds of, of self-employed people and um, I think that separates a lot of people are successful and are doing really well and um, in their businesses, but we have to have that, once again, differentiating between the good self-employed people and the great ones. One of the factors of the, the great ones are able to take you know, money each week or day or month and set it aside. Now, one of the downsides, if you work at PNC, you can have a 401k. I think most, most of us know what that is. So self-employed people don't have a 401k. Um, but one thing we have is you can do um, a SEP, is what it's called, SEP. Stands for self-employed pension, I believe. So it's, um, and that's something where it's basically your own initiated uh, retirement plan. So um, the good thing about that is, um, although there's no matching, you know, PNC will, will match a certain percentage, and things like that. Um, the, the one good thing about a SEP is, is you're allowed to contribute more. If you have a healthy profit in your business and you're sick of paying taxes, this is one really good ex example of how to get your tax burden down while saving. Because uh, one attractive part about the SEP 
is that it will, um, you can contribute more. Um, you know, I don't have the, the stats in front of me, but let's say within $1,000 or so, you know, you can, you can put about 16,000 or 15,000 into a 401k. And I apologize for not having the stat in front of me. Um, that's an approximate number. With uh, a SEP, you can contribute 25% um, of your profit, and it's up to about 40, in the neighborhood of $40,000. So once again, if you have a healthy profit, this is a great way to do it. And it's a great way to, um, I, I'm pretty decent and okay at thinking of deductions that you've never heard of before. But when I meet a new client that's self-employed, I kind of try to triage things where, okay, this, you know, a lot of folks have heard of the SEP or heard of, you know, saving on their own, but um, I try to make sure that's accomplished first, these kind of fundamental things before we start, um, you know, thinking of really neat deductions that nobody's heard of. So this is something you just have to take advantage of because of course nobody's knocking on your door from HR um, telling you to sign up for your retirement plan. So um, the one thing too, um, a couple other things that I wanted everybody to know about is um, one thing that kept us busy this year at our office is um, being a resource for businesses, sole proprietors, you know, one person businesses. They don't even have to have any employees oftentimes and all of the um, things related to Corona and things that the SBA is doing and different grants and things that the IRS is doing. Um, there is a tremendous amount uh, of, of pending legislation and, um, you know, as I kind of, uh, you know, we're August 26th right now, you know, a lot of us in the office are already focusing on January of next year for, for tax planning and getting ready uh, for the tax season. Um, so, you know, the one thing is um, there's, there's going to be, I, I think, a lot more because there, there could be more uh, stimulus, every, the, the $1,200 and the $500 per child. Um, there's, there's a PPP, which is the Paycheck Protection Program for the SBA. There, is, there are a lot of programs. So this isn't a, um, a thing, a, a shameless plug for me. It's just if find somebody. Um, and if you're self-employed, the reality of the um, you know, the tax preparation industry now is it's different than when I started. Um, if you have one W-2, it's, it's, it's pretty easy to do your tax return. It is. And I, I don't want to sidestep that. And, but it, what I always say is if, if their comfort level is good, keep it, keep it going. If, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But when somebody is self-employed, I feel unbiased when I say, uh, as an accountant, an unbiased response to that is they have to have somebody because there are so many uh, opportunities and things to uh, uh, things that we can caution you against. So, uh, especially with COVID, there's going to be a lot more coming down the pike here, and uh, a lot of things that are uh, that are still, you know, being talked about on the Senate floor and things like that. So, um, one thing I was going to mention at the end, but if anyone that was a uh, attendee here today or listened after the fact, if you have any questions and um, you're get, having trouble getting a hold of your accountant or you don't have one, um, just, just call me. One, one of the things I'll reiterate at the end, but I'm gonna offer everybody a free consultation. So if you have anything like you feel like you got maybe missed some things um, through COVID and, and those types of things that are out there through the SBA, um, we studied these things long and hard. And um, so we, we know, know a fair amount about it. So. Um, just please keep that in mind. I'll mention that again at the end too. Um, a couple of things too um, that I like to talk about um, is, is we deal with, in our office, um, we do taxes, payroll, and accounting. And on the tax side, which is my kind of baby, um, we have different little uh, groups of clients that we get that we categorize. And you know, one of the, one of the groups that we deal a lot with is we like startups. We, we, we really do. Uh, and a lot of uh, accountants don't like startups. And I get why. Um, the way businesses work, unfortunately, the majority of them fail. So I think a lot of my colleagues that I've talked to 
don't want to invest time with a client that's not going to be there in a year or two because their business is going to go go under. Um, we kind of look at a different look at it as a different approach where um, we're willing to invest the time. Um, of course, we're realistic. Some businesses work and, and some businesses don't. The reason I bring this up is that the second category of clients that we deal with a lot are um, people that owe to the IRS. They owe big bucks to the IRS. Um, and they're getting letters, and liens, and levies. And so I often sort of, it's tough. When I meet some of those people, you know, they're, they're good people. And a lot of, you know, they, they're people that make mistakes and, and had a bad year and it steamrolls. And then all of a sudden we haven't filed for several years and we owe a bunch of money. It happens to good people every day. Um, but the, the sensation that I always get are that I wish I can have a time machine because a lot of these folks that if I don't, I, the point of it is if I see someone as a startup, I generally don't have, they don't have tax problems down the road. And, and conversely, if, if I see somebody that has tax problems, they probably oftentimes didn't have a, a, a dialogue or relationship with somebody from the get go. And it kind of, you know, it gets worse and worse. So, um, you know, but one thing is people, you're, if you do all the IRS, you're not, you're far from alone. Um, I wanted to read a couple stats too, um, cause maybe you, you may not owe, um, I think one in 50 people owe the IRS some money. Um, so maybe your neighbor or your, your mother or sister or somebody owes and it's debilitating. It's tough. The IRS is the biggest collection agency in the United States. So it's for good reason. But, um, between 2018 and 2019, um, the IRS has increased their, their tax liens by 33%. Um, and then the IRS has also increased levies, um, which is where they take money out of your bank account and out of your, or out of your paycheck. They've increased those 22%. Um, you know, basically, uh, once again, seven and a half million people didn't have a, are, are behind on their taxes. And then also there's um, 19 million people owe the IRS money and the amount of their bill collectively is about $391 billion. So I recite all these stats just to, if somebody out there happens to owe or happen to be behind, um, you'd be surprised on, this isn't a blue collar thing, this isn't a white collar thing, young, old, race, religion, any of that. I, it's literally, I've seen all walks of life, industries, that have had tax problems. So, um, so part of that is, um, you know, just we, we gotta, if, you, if you're a startup, don't be afraid to, to put in the work on the front end. I think it'll pay dividends to anything, uh, cash flow management and kind of learning some of those tricks that you can avoid tax problems on the back end. Um, now, one thing here is, um, that I try to, I don't say ramble to my clients or lecture. I don't hope I'm not lecturing, ever lecturing any clients. Um, this has a bad connotation. But one thing that I talk a lot about is a lot of people um, come to our office and they liken it to the dentist's office. They, you know, the dentist, they, some of these folks never had a cavity. They've never had a root canal. There's no reason for them to fear the dentist. It's just a mental hang up. And that's similar to people that they have uh, a mental hang up in our office. They just don't like taxes. They, they can't stand them. They don't get it or they just, they just don't like, it. and a lot of these folks get refunds. So it's not that they, they associate taxes with owing a bunch of money. Um, so what I mean by that is what I always, you know, I hear a lot of, maybe I should have filed this under the quotables, but um, when I hear a lot of people saying, um, uh, is basically, I'm not a business person. I'm an architect or a chiropractor or an artist or a boat builder. But I think the reality of it is, is that um, we're all, we have to be, uh, you know, we can't just rely on that we're just a technician within a business. We're, we're all business people. If we, if we, you went to hang your shingle out there, we have to kind of, even though you don't consider yourself a numbers person, we just have to sort of um, learn it 
and not be afraid of it. Because a lot of times, once again, that fear of the dentist's office when you've never had a cavity or the fear of the accountant that I've never had a tax problem is, is, um, is a real thing. So um, one, one tip that a lot of tips that I have here is basically, um, you know, you're self-employed, you're officially a, by default a numbers person now. We just have to, to deal with it and get over the, the fear of it. Um, you know, one of the things that I try to encourage people to do is to prepare their numbers um, at least, at the very least, on a monthly basis for a lot of different reasons. Um, if you've been in business for a number of years, it's really, really beneficial and impactful to have numbers where you can compare them. Um, we're pretty, you know, we're, of course, we're being counters here, so our financial statements, you know, we are pretty crazy about it where we know, um, you know, based on this day last year or this month, this week, this year, things like that, we're constantly comparing and looking back um, and, and try to compare with prior periods. A lot of folks, you know, and this goes to, I have a lot of successful uh, clients that are um, self-employed there. You ask them how much money they have and they look in their bank account. And that, of course, isn't the, the way to do it. Um, so my recommendation was, would be to try to get, if you have a fear of it, find somebody you like and trust. Um, you know, Dave Ramsey calls it a, the heart of a teacher. Find somebody that will sit down with you and, and, and kind of uh, demystify this for you. And what I would recommend is doing it on a, at least a monthly basis, like I mentioned, being able to compare it to, to prior years is, is hugely beneficial for us. Um, and then one, one benefit of it is the people that I've had that have done this on a monthly basis, um, a lot of these folks in the past have filed extensions and have come in in October. Uh, and so while they're preparing their taxes, they're working on stuff now that is, uh, you know, 20 months old and trying to recollect things from 20 months ago, which is very hard. Um, so if anything, it makes the tax uh, prep process uh, easier for you where you're collecting your data for tax time. Uh, you can do it quicker. And, and things like that. And then another reason uh, to prepare your financial statements or just um, reconcile, find out where you are with income and expenses with your business is if I've, is the reason why is I've had a lot of clients that don't necessarily keep track of it. They consider themselves savers. They've never had cash flow issues. And, and I'd agree with all those things for most of the clients if they would say that. Um, but what happens is sometimes people have an opportunity where they can buy a piece of property or buy a facility, but, and it's a really good deal, but they need to act on it uh, right away. So that's another downside of, you know, a lot of folks uh, have the profitability, but they just haven't prepared anything yet. So that's something that is, uh, happens all the time and uh, something I would caution against. So just, um, I think that's really, um, really, you know, kind of, we're at, we're at about 1240. Um, that's really what I kind of had in mind. I just want to kind of dispel a couple things, um, you know, but I'll close with, um, with the Corona and the, the types of items. Um, I was pretty ag aggressive in our client list and I, we called a lot of people and cause my thing for our offices, I didn't want people coming in during tax time in, in February or March of 2021 and saying, Oh, I didn't think I, I was eligible for that. That would have uh, frustrated me. So um, don't um, exclude yourself or think you're not eligible for something until you, you talk to somebody like, you know, once again, it's not a self for me, but talk to somebody like me if, um, that you like and trust that, that has dealt with it a lot. So there's a lot out there. And even if you're a solo, uh, one person, uh, one person business, no employees, you don't need a, oftentimes you don't need a storefront office or to pay any wages or things like that. So, um, so in closing, um, I, I, I'd love to take some questions if you guys have any. If it's something that you ha I haven't brought up, just ask away. Hopefully by now, um, I can talk about taxes for hours and put everybody to sleep tonight if you'd allow me to. So I, I have a, a love for taxes. Um, once again, the challenge is to make it exciting, uh, which is, it's tough to do, but um, 
if anyone on this, once again, uh, live or after the fact uh, has a question, um, just call me or email me. My phone number is 655-1040, 655-1040. And my email address is William, spelled out, at TotalIncomeTax.com. That's William at TotalIncomeTax.com. So um, I'm still learning on this Zoom, so I should have had a cute little uh, bio with all my, all my uh, credentials and contact information, and, and I didn't, I apologize. But once again, if um, you have tax problems, if, if you're at a point in your business where you need some more guidance and uh, the person you have now isn't really a, a small business expert or anything like that, um, just just call me and I don't, um, if you're an attendee to this webinar where it's, it's, it's all just a free consultation, a free conversation. So with that, thanks for having me. And I'm going to, I think, throw it back to, to Catherine and, and who's kind of, if you have any questions, I think she's been keeping track of them and we'll, um, thanks again. Have a good afternoon. Hey there. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, I don't see any questions quite yet. Um, but I do have one from when we were first scheduling our sessions. Um, someone who suggested this topic um, thought that people might be interested in knowing one how donations can be beneficial to a business, which I'm not quite sure what angle she was going for because you'd think yes. donations would be, um, but and no. how to record them to receive the most financial benefit for your business. No, absolutely. I, I, that's a good point. Actually, there's some if I can talk about that for a second, um, both as a business and as a, um, you know, let's say if, if you have a corporation, for example, and you donate um, as a business, um, you know, that flows to your, your personal tax return often, oftentimes. Um, now, um, there's one, you know, new piece of uh, press that's out there from the IRS is, you know, recently the IRS changed the, the standard deduction and they changed they increased it which is which is helpful they increased it um, and they took away your exemption and etc and not to get too uh, uh, jargon heavy but one issue that people that tithe or make donations or go to goodwill is they may not have enough donations coupled with their other deductions um, to uh, exceed that standard deduction where the donations will help well, the uh, IRS has recently come out and said, I think it's, it's, up to, it's pretty new within a week or so, the IRS will allow you to take $300 um, and, and, and it will benefit you and you don't have to exceed your standard deduction. So that's a new thing. I was hoping, I, I heard about the concept that was changing and I was really excited. And then I saw that the maximum was 300 bucks and I kind of was deflated a little bit, but that still does help. Um, I wish it was a little bit bigger because I have a lot of folks that tithe at, at church, but, you know, a married couple has to exceed 22, 24,000. And, and although they're, they're get, you know, so it's frustrating when somebody gives 10 or $12,000 a year and, and they don't exceed their um, standard deduction. So that's frustrating. And I, I hope that that $300 is increased, but it doesn't look like it. Now, the other thing is how to maximize it to where um, there's also gifts in kind. Um, so that is, um, you know, if you're selling products at your business, you can donate your products. Um, and, and I can help anybody that's out there that is how to document that properly. And then also if you can, um, if you're giving up, clearing out a facility and you're giving things to a, a charitable organization, there's a way to document that stuff too. Um, so the, it's all with the gifts in kind, it's all, it's all sort of in the, uh, in the documentation is, is where the, uh, the details are important with that. So that's similar to the auto expense where if you don't have a decent log for those gifts in kind, they'll be, IRS will be kind of quick to uh, take that away from you. So I hope that answers the, if that's what you're thinking about, Catherine, I hope that answers your question. Thank you, yeah, thank you. I, I don't know since it wasn't my original question, but hopefully, I think, I'm sure it does, so. Good five minute um, answer for you, sorry. <laughs> no, that's great, thank you. Uh, we do have a couple more questions coming in here. Awesome. Um, 
Do you recommend an LLC with one owner and an employee to be taxed like a sole proprietorship or like a subchapter S corporation? That's a really good question. Um, that's a really good question. Now, um, lately what we've been doing is, um, you know, what I, what I tend to encounter a lot is the LLC is another thing from um, that, you know, my, not to beat up on the barber, but just as a sort of a figurative thing of, I was at the barber shop and they said I, I needed to be an LLC. Now an LLC isn't, um, isn't the, the, the best for everybody, it depends on your situation. But the good part about the LLC is you have some alternatives, okay? You have, you can form an LLC, you can be a corporation, you can be a, a, a sole proprietor, but with an LLC, um, what we recommend oftentimes is um, to form an LLC and you can make what's called an S election, which you can be treated as an S corp for tax purposes, but have the liability protection um, uh, of an LLC. Um, frankly, that's what I am. Um, and one of the benefits of that is, um, is you have the liability protection of the LLC and any profit from an S corp is not subject to self-employment tax. Now, a lot of folks, you know, sophomore advice will tell you to just, um, you know, take all of your uh, profits as an S corp and uh, you pay less taxes. Well, the IRS wants you to take a, a reasonable salary as an S corp too. Um, what I would, to answer your question, to avoid another five minute answer, um, I would oftentimes recommend um, to form an LLC, become an S corp and take a reasonable salary. Um, it's a lot easier uh, for cash flow management and tax planning. Um, and it avoids, if somebody's struggling with um, estimated tax payments, for example, um, I don't make estimated tax payments. What I do is I take a reasonable salary and I, you know, most people's withholdings on their paychecks are just for that paycheck. Where what you would do is you change it to where maybe you would over withhold for that paycheck because you were withholding for your profit as well as your, uh, your paycheck. So it's, it sort of, you know, avoids cash flow crunches and things like that. So, um, you know, basically, I hope, I hope that answers the question, but I would, I would recommend the S Corp. The downside is um, it's, you know, you have to do a payroll and it's something you've never done before. Um, and there's more layers that makes corporate behavior a little bit more challenging and there's more layers to it. Um, so that's the downside. But I think the pros, once you get the process down, the pros far, far number the cons. And, uh, I think I see another question here is, um, how do you document a barber, a barter between two businesses? Um, so that's really good. And there's a lot of, what I often do um, through, um, um, uh, you know, there's different, with, with Googling things, I'll take, for example, there's a, a mileage reimbursement form that we use for mileage that's from like Cornell University. So there's a lot of resources out there, but they have the company letterhead. Um, and I think I've, I've used the same with um, a, a barter receipt. Basically, um, you know, this tends to help it be a lot easier when you're bartering products. Um, when you're bartering services, it's a lot more challenging because, you know, I have an hourly rate. Of course, you know, maybe if I'm unscrupulous, I may um, barter for uh, maybe my hourly rate will be inflated all of a sudden. So it's a lot easier, but we just want to document, uh, you know, put it in the file um, and then put it on the tax return. A lot of, a lot of people, um, what they will do is net it out, basically, and what that means is um, let's say they made $10,000 and they have a barter expense for uh, 1000 They'll just net it out at nine. And I think that's a little too oversimplified. Um, frankly, I don't see a lot of recent um, uh, IRS, uh, you know, people's numbers getting pulled and the IRS wanting to talk to you because of bartering. But I do think it's something that if you have it on a regular basis, just, just to document it, of what the price, uh, a little description, doesn't have to be war and peace, doesn't have to be super lengthy, just a, a documentation of what you are sending out and what you're receiving and the you know, date and, and who, to whom it was with. I think if you did that, that would cover a lot of your bases and stick it in your file. And I think you'd be 
uh, it would substantiate any questions that an IRS auditor may have. So. All right. Oops. So Thank I think, you. Oh, sorry. Were you? No, no. I think I think we got. Yeah, there were two questions. So I think we uh, we got through those. But I have plenty of time. So if anyone has any other questions or anything like that, um, um, you know, one thing I might to to touch back on um, a little bit is I don't see any. And if I pop up, I'll I'll stop and uh, go to the next question. But just about that. Uh, the, the previous question about entity choice, um, that's a very important thing that, you know, this could be a, an hour long just with that. And um, what I do is I, you know, partner with, if they have an attorney, I partner with them, or, or you know, we have a couple of recommendations that, that form LLCs and form corporations, but it's really, uh, it's, it's a really important uh, thing as you start out in your business. Um, cause one of the downsides of a sole proprietorship is that, um, you know, a lot of us that are self-employed know this is this dreaded self-employment tax that is over and above your income tax. So, um, it, a lot of it, it helps to kind of lighten the, lighten the blow of that. Um, so entity choice is a, is a huge thing. So it's something that, um, as if you're preparing to, um, I, I always tell people there's times in business to save money and be really thrifty and there's times to not be so analytical and so cheap at times, um, especially as accountants, we're definitely guilty of that. But one of those times I think we should, we should retain somebody and, and talk and spend some money is with entity choice. That's a, something that's really important. So just want to touch on that. Thank you. So I don't think I see any other questions coming in and we are just about at the end of the hour, but did you awesome. have any other thoughts that you'd like to share before we close out tonight? No, I just, I just wanted to thank you and thank uh, everybody in Chile and beyond for, for having me. And then, but, but please take me up on my offer. I, I, uh, and with no real expectation of just answering the question, you know, so that's why we've tried to, um, I'm a third generation accountant and I watched my granddad um, give a lot of free consultations over the years and uh, um, just to answer questions. And sometimes it doesn't come back to help you ever. And that's fine. Sometimes it's over five years and just, but just, um, just realize that if you don't have anybody as a resource, now you do, you know, and, and just as you move forward, if, if anyone out there has any questions, um, uh, just to, to ring me up or email me or, or call me and I'm, we, we like uh, we like talking about taxes so thanks very much and people just you know just use your the number that you shared or your email to contact yes yes six five five ten forty is the number whoops and I dropped that in the chat but I realized I just sent it to all the panelists rather than the attendees so awesome. there we go. <laughs> I see. now everyone should be able to see that and there's my email too yeah once again sorry for no Next time I gotta get my Zoom stuff together where I'm, I gotta get more uh, PowerPoint, uh, get fancier my PowerPoints. You wouldn't have liked the PowerPoint I, I came in with. It would have been, it would have been uh, pretty boring, but, uh, but thanks for, I uh, hope I didn't bore anybody just with the sound of my voice and, and uh, with no visual aids there. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. Oh, looks like we may have one more yeah. question. Oh, someone is asking what okay. an enrolled agent is. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we're like the forgotten stepchild of the CPA a little bit. Um, so it's um, basically, in all seriousness, um, the, an enrolled agent is a designation from, uh, from the IRS. So I'm licensed through the IRS um, and, and I'm enrolled to practice in, in all 50 states. So what it means is, um, you know, quick, to quickly compare it to a CPA, a CPA, um, there's a three or four part test and it deals with audit and, um, and, and different things and taxes, but a, a lot of it with a CPA, it's based around auditing. Um, you know, that's not something that, that we do. We don't audit uh, businesses uh, or not-for-profits. You know, an enrolled agent is a designation that is, um, it's mainly tax centric. It's a, it's a three part test that's all about taxes and things like that. So um, 
the other thing is, as an enrolled agent, I can represent people before the IRS with audit or collection issues. Um, and I can do that all the way up to tax court, um, just like a, a CPA could. So I don't think as if someone has issues and they're um, uh, trying to, you know, compare the designations, um, most of my, you're not going to have any uh, less representation by choosing an enrolled agent over a CPA. For us, you know, in our office, my partner is a CPA, and I and it was a little overkill where I I didn't think I needed to be a CPA when he did. He already had those designations, so I went out and sought the enrolled agent. So, and we also have um, uh, there's three enrolled agents and a CPA in our office. I, I think that's right, at least three. So, uh, that's a good question that nobody knows about. So, now everybody knows what an enrolled agent is. So, thanks for the question. All right, thank you. I'm just going to jump back in here to, there we are, um, and thank everyone for tuning in today as well as to previous events in the series. I see, that I think everyone who's here today has tuned in to some, at least some of the other ones, so I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, and when I close this webinar, uh, those of you who are attending through Zoom will be prompted to fill out a survey. Um, and please do fill that out for us. And if you want to enter to win a prize, one last chance to enter, um, please do make sure to include your name and contact information. And I'll be contacting the winners soon once we've gone through all our entries. So thank you all folks. Have a good afternoon and take care. <laughs>